Today we are joined by uh, Stephanie Kammerer, who uh, you may not have heard of, but uh, she's uh, had a couple um, couple stories. Well, actually, just one story. Uh, can everybody see my video, by the way? Um, in uh, Skeptical Inquirer, uh, Life. Well, I believe the original title was what, Stephanie? Life, the Q-Universe, and everything. Um, yeah, all about, um, well, you know, every, the topic we can't get away from anymore, uh, QAnon. And uh, Stephanie, actually a former conspiracy theory believer herself, and now she's uh, uh, fighting the good fight in the darkest corners of the internet. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to um, have her come here today and talk to us about where she came from and what she does. And uh, obviously it's uh, a little different from the things that we do. So I thought that kind of perspective was uh, interesting. Stephanie, how are you doing? Uh, if you're, I will unmute you in one second. Or we can just lip read. We'll bad lip read. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Make our own conspiracies about what you said. All right, Stephanie, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. And uh, by the way, uh, I guess I should go through the normal stuff. Uh, what you're watching now is a presentation of the New York City Skeptics. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of critical thinking and science education. I just put a, a link in the chat if you'd like to donate to us. Uh, it is completely tax deductible. So if you want to get your records looking good before the end of the year, that's a good way to do it. Um, I will post a couple other things later. Well, here's the I know everybody came from Meta, probably. Um, I'm just going to post it one more time because there's article links down at the bottom of that um, to uh, Stephanie's Skeptical Inquirer articles about Q. Um, if you haven't read them, I recommend them. Um, so, Stephanie, how did you end up writing those articles for Skeptical Inquirer? I'm curious. Um, I had heard marginally about Q and then about maybe two months before the 2020 election, I was listening to a Skullduggery podcast and they were going more in depth. And I, and I write for a podcast also called Even the Podcast is Afraid. And I was like, I have a platform, I have a duty. I wanna look into this more and really dig deep into it. So I, I wrote a two part episode for the podcast and then during that time, I was listening to QAnon Anonymous podcast, and I couldn't stop. So I, was, I reached out to Kendrick, and I was like, hey, uh, you want an article on this? And he replied back right away. So it was... Did you, uh, did you have a pre-existing relationship in the, with those folks? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... Oh, you had written... That's right. You had written something way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah in 2014. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's the here's the real question, though. This is what I'm leading up to because I know, as you, you're not ashamed to say that you were a conspiracy believer yourself at one point. Um, yes. Can you kind of tell us, you know, where your head was at at that point, and kind of what led you away from it, and what led you to this point? I guess. Uh, well, I mean, I, I've told people like I've always had like a predilection to that stuff. I mean, I was like seven years old reading about UFOs and Bigfoot and ghosts and stuff. And that's fairly innocuous, but no conspiracy theory is actually innocuous. If you really look into it, they're all just gateway drugs to harder things. Gateway and then, is what I said. Yes, yes. And then um, apparently this movie has pilled a lot of people i watched zeitgeist in like 2014 late 2014 early 2015 and it's high quality i mean it's it's kind of like um oh what's the 9 11 one that was on netflix uh loose change oh someone asked a question pilled uh it refers to taking the red pill it's when you when you get pilled or someone's pilling you, you're going down the rabbit hole. Um, but, uh, and Zeitgeist is really slick. It's really good. And they start off with like the same thing that they go through in religious, you know, like the whole thing about like here, you know, all these religions actually come from this, this and that. And you're like, okay, I've heard this before. Yeah. And they're like, okay, so now we presented you with some truth. 
So now let's shove some sovereign citizen and nanothermite controlled demolition down your throat. And then I just, I was, I just watched every, I even saw the new Pearl Harbor, which is a five hour long 9-11 conspiracy documentary. And then I eventually got to the point where I was a no planer. I believed that all the planes were CGI. And, um, and then that wasn't enough. So then I was listening to Jim Fetzer and Alex Jones talk about Sandy Hook. And I was listening to David Icke talk about reptilians. <laughs> so it, it was, uh, yeah. And, and someone tried, you know, getting me in the flat earth. And I'm like, no, no, no. I have my lines. I that's have where my you, lines, man. That's where you drew yeah. the line. Yeah. But that's interesting, though, because um, so this, let's go back to the beginning again, zeitgeist. Now, where mm -hmm. did you see that originally? Well, first of all, where did you hear about it? And where did you end up watching it? Or how did you end up watching it? I think it was on Netflix and I was just browsing really? and yeah. Well, Loose Change was on Netflix at one point too. What's that one? That's, um, that's another slick, well-made 9-11 conspiracy documentary. And to their credit, the guys who made it, there's like 10 different versions out there. They update it with new information. Wow. And yeah, it's pretty... It's so would you say wild. that would so would you say that a lot of this conspiracy media that you were consuming did it come from because my immediate thought was oh my it must be YouTube pushing bullshit on somebody but was it even more quote unquote legitimate sources than that um not really like legitimate sources but I mean when you when you have a documentary that's on Netflix like you know I've learned since then that you yeah. know like I, I mean it's just because it's on Netflix doesn't mean it. I mean because look at what the History Channel and the Discovery right. Channel have become and, I, and I'll even tell you National Geographic I saw a National Geographic documentary about what it, high in Hollywood it was called and they interviewed this supposedly homeless kid who was claiming to be a meth addict well I knew that guy that they were interviewing and he was not a meth head. He was not homeless. He was doing gay pornography in Hollywood at the time. So he either lied to them or they hired him to play a role. Wow. So that like changed, like I'm not saying I don't believe anything, but that just put it in perspective. Like some of this stuff isn't really credible. Yeah. I know I've definitely gone, to, I won't say a rabbit hole, but I've gone down a hole on some of those streaming services. And Tubi seems to be the most egregious of just hosting all kinds of, like you said, well-made nonsense. Um, I guess it's, a, it's something we really need to think about because we always think about like, well, don't believe everything you see on YouTube. But it's not just YouTube, but, you know, it's kind of. No, everywhere. no. Yeah. And um, you can you can uh, get a subscription to Gaia streaming services oh, through Amazon right. now. <laughs> and what is Gaia? I've heard that I've, I've looked at it for like five seconds. Gaia is just the most ridiculous. I mean, you want to do a documentary about people who think they're aliens or. Uh, People who are claiming to contact the dead, Gaia is your, that's your thing. All right. All right. Well, I think that was a, a worthwhile diversion. But anyway, to continue your story, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it just, uh, and actually an interesting thing is uh, there's a, a podcast called The New Conspiracists. And um, they start off every episode asking their guest, you know, what's your, you know, what got you into conspiracies? And, I swear to you, every single episode I've listened to, they all say zeitgeist. Wow. It's like, yeah. it's bullshit zero. It, it is, yeah, bullshit zero. It, it, it is. And um, it, it's, it, it's a really interesting propaganda technique to start off with something that has a basis in historical fact. Right. And then you just keep leading them down the well, that's how, if you listen to uh, if you listen to this hard science fiction off, authors, that's what they'll tell you. That's how they set up their stories is they'll start with real science and then go a little further and try to get you to buy that. And then you can go a little further uh, because I'm going to guess I'm going to guess if somebody came up to you 
pre-zeitgeist <laughs> before you saw that and said, oh yeah, reptilians rule the world and no planes ever hit the World Trade Center, you'd be like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> well, I, 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 might, I might not have because I, I was off and on, but zeitgeist was, you know, I, was, I had a few David I, Ike books that I actually paid for. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, but it, it would be something that I would kind of get into for a little while and throw aside. But then after Zeitgeist, it was just, I got a huge dopamine hit from it. And I was just like constantly seeking out more of that. And it just got more and more extreme. So what happened? Um, I had, well, I, I had some, very close friends of mine who came out to visit us in California in like uh, late 2016, early 2017, I think. And um, I said to my one friend, I was like, you know, I really don't know about that Sandy Hook thing. I think that was fake. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I work with someone who lost a child at Sandy Hook. And I didn't ask for a name. I didn't ask for, this was someone I've known 20 years at the time. I trusted her and I apologized. And when they went home, I looked up. I did the same thing I always did on YouTube, except I added an extra word. I typed in 9-11 conspiracy theories and then I typed in debunked. And I found a seven part series. I wish I could remember the name of it. Um, that debunked all of the major myths. And at the end, they talked about the mind of a conspiracy theorist. And they use the example of the external locus of control. And they said, an example would be, you're tired, your alarm goes off and you keep hitting snooze, you're running late to work and you're behind a slow driver. And instead of accepting blame, that you're the one that hit snooze, you're blaming the driver in front of you. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's exactly how I act. And I, I had this, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I just looked up and I said, I'm not gonna be like that anymore. And I mean, it takes a long time to actually get into a healthy mindset, but, and, and you know, some people, you know, are like, how'd you, a lot of people ask me, how'd you get out? And my circumstance is actually pretty unique. Not yeah. too many people know someone who knows someone and, you know, and that, um, and it's like, if it's a stranger telling you, no, these beliefs aren't true, it's not going to fit as much as a close friend yeah <clears throat> yeah well it's kind of like um it's almost like it's almost like using the the bad methods from good people because i mean a lot of people come to belief because well you know my buddy says this is true and i trust him and uh, and of course as the deeper you get the more those kinds of people become your friends and family yeah, but it, it also can isolate you if, if you're an already isolated person, you, it, it's, you know, it's almost like a segregation process, right, where you have this mindset, and you know, because of this mindset that you can't really integrate with other people on the same level. So you're seeking out the other people who have wild ideas, too. Uh, Bill actually asked, I think it's a good a question in the chat. Um, could you explain why you found conspiracy theories so satisfying when you did? Um, I, I, I think it, it, it all goes back to helplessness, hopelessness, feeling a lack of control in your life. And also the, you know, the feeling that it may sound counterintuitive, but the feeling that everything is under control is actually comforting, even if it's easy. Like, you know, it's easier to think the government did Oklahoma City or, you know, 
Columbine or Sandy Hook were fake. It's easier to think that than to come to the startling realization that people are, there are some evil people out there and they do bad things and you have to deal with that. Yeah, well, that's something that we as skeptics that that's something we tell ourselves a lot. That seems to be what the research says, but it's really uh, striking to hear to hear it from somebody's mouth directly like that. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's um, I, and my uh, my friend Jatarth, um, he's he's a former QAnon follower. He's been on CNN a few times, and for him, he he said that he kind of had a similar reaction that I did when he got out of it just this crushing, like weeping, sobbing, like curled in a fetal position, like soul crushing death inside of you. Wow. Like, because you have to, it, it, it would, it's kind of like, you know, in train spotting when he's going through the withdrawal and he's hallucinating the baby and all the bad things that happen because the drug dulls you and the conspiracy theories are like a drug that completely dull you and then once that drug is taken away you have to deal with all the bad things about yourself and all the bad things about the world like you said as long as somebody's in control that's somehow more <laughs> that's somehow more reassuring than just random things happening and you have to be to live with it right yeah so okay so that's where it started and and again and you're right. I think that is a unique kind of story because obviously we try to, obviously those quote unquote debunking videos don't work for everybody. A lot of people already have their minds made up and they don't want to listen to it, especially now in the era of quote unquote fake news. People will just say, well, that came from, I don't like you, so I'm not going to believe anything you say. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So that was step one. What uh, you said, it's a process. I think we all, all of us, I think a lot of us believed weird things when we were kids. So, okay, how did the rest of the process go? Um, I had a talk with my boyfriend at the time and I apologized to him because I was getting him into this stuff too, but he maintained a more level head and all that. And then um, it may sound weird and it may sound like virtue signaling, but I went on Facebook and I made a public post that said, I no longer believe in conspiracy theories. I apologize for everything I've ever said or posted. And it was wrong and I was wrong and I'm sorry. And someone replied like, wow, that's so brave of you. And I was like, what, how is that? I, to me, it just seems natural to admit when you're wrong. So, you know. That, that was the other step. And I, I really, this was like 2016, 2017, when I was kind of getting my head together. And, um, you know, I, I didn't actively fight back against it really so much, but I was just more in a better headspace. And as soon as the whole COVID thing happened, the, the, the one thing that I like that I've managed to retain is that thought process. I can, you can show me any headline and I'll tell you what, I'll give you a guess of how they're gonna spin it, you know? And so when COVID happened and the lockdown started, I saw everyone going insane on Facebook and I tried my best to fight against it and report you know, posts and tell people, you know, like, this isn't helpful, you know, don't talk about this stuff, you know, leave this off and they'd be like, well, I'm just speaking my truth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, your truth about a virus is going to get people killed. Right. It's, and it's, <laughs> people seem to have for forgotten what the word opinion means. Uh, they seem to think you can have a, an opinion about objective reality, which doesn't really work that way. Um, but yeah, um, well, you know, we've talked to James Tynan IV, who writes the Conspiracy Theory comic, uh, the Department of Truth, and he was, he was researching conspiracy theory, you know, the book's been out for a year or two now, and he was doing research, obviously, well in advance, in advance of 
uh, the 2016 election, or excuse me, the 2020 election in advance of COVID. And um, so he had, QAnon was on his monitor, so to speak, but he actually kind of didn't want to include it early on. He was kind of deciding against it because it seemed to be on the downswing, but then the lockdown really seems to have uh, energized them, doesn't it? Well, yeah, what, what, it, what had happened was it, it was this bizarre phenomena. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, on the face, like, well, okay, the lockdowns must have made people wonder what was really going on with COVID. But what it was, was financial insecurities, more time at home with little or nothing to do. And, you know, COVID being a big thing and all that, people are looking it up and suddenly, you know, you're down a rabbit hole and you're staying up. I mean, a, lo a lot of the people who got pilled during COVID, um, they basically, I've heard stories, uh, not just the people pilled during COVID, but I've heard stories of QAnon followers who are up, you know, online 16 hours a day, decoding things and it's just scary that, you know, like the addiction that it gives. And, and I have some thoughts, you know, I, I wonder, I like to play the what if game, except the what if game that I play is terrifying. Mm -hmm. If my friend hadn't said that to me at that time, you know, would I have gotten in a QAnon? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna actually gonna put a link in the chat. We're gonna try to hold as many questions as we can to the end, but some of these we'll try to get to. Um, the link I just put in the chat was uh, something I did uh, about the first issue of Department of Truth. I interviewed Nick West about conspiracy belief in general, and um, he talks a lot about those same things, about the insecurity uh, that came with the lockdown and the isolation. Um, Bill asked about the uh, financial insecurity and how that can lead to belief. Do you have anything more to say about that? I can. Uh, well, I mean, any anything that you're used to that is changed by, you know, forces beyond your control, that leads you to question, you know, what am I doing here? Why is this happening? And, you know, when you're in that situation and COVID, but I mean, I was traumatized when COVID first started. Like I was checking the numbers every day. I was crying, looking at picture. Back when it was bad in Italy, I would just look at these pictures online and just like cry. And, you know, trauma can change your brain. It makes changes within your brain. And it can cause a, almost a, um, you're seeking out more trauma because you're already traumatized. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really weird and counterintuitive, but it, it just, it's a, a, a cycle that can be very, very hard to break. So did you, were you ever a QAnon believer or did those two times not really overlap? Um, I got out of it before QAnon, but uh -huh. prior, but I did watch a lot of Pizzagate documentaries and I was just like, oh, this is interesting stuff. But I'd, I, the, the satanic pedophile conspiracies have been around for a long, long right. time. And even just watching the Pizzagate documentaries, I'd be like, well, maybe, and I'm like, yeah, Pizza but Gate. Pizza, Pizza Gate, by the way, for those who are blissfully unaware, was the idea that Hillary Clinton and other Democrats would what watch child pornography and drink their blood or something. Yeah, there was supposed to be a basement at Comic Ping Pong Pizza, and when the guy drove up from North Carolina to investigate, and he fired a few rounds in the pizzeria. He discovered to his dismay there was no basement. I think he got four years in jail yeah. for that. Um, all right, so here's a dual prong question. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, let's start here. So, what got you so interested in QAnon to begin with, just because it was the thing on everybody's mind? 
Well, just um, here, I was actually apparently battling QAnon people on Facebook during the COVID lockdowns without realizing who they were. I just, you know, I knew QAnon existed, but I never really looked into it. And just seeing how things were exploding with COVID conspiracies. And then it was just right before the election. And I was like, and, and I heard that Skullduggery podcast episode. And I was like, wow, this sounds really dangerous, really, really dangerous. And I was like, I, I, you know, and I was terrified about this election. And I think a lot, I don't, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that a lot of reasonable people were concerned that if Biden wasn't elected, we were never, ever going to get rid of Trump, ever. He would just get a third term, a fourth term and install himself for life. And well, he I was, anyway. Yeah. And I was like, I was just thinking to myself, you know, I have a platform. I, I don't actually talk on the podcast, but I have a platform to write and get information out there. And maybe that will help people. Like I felt like it was kind of a moral imperative to kind of get the word out to right before the election. I wasn't trying to turn people to vote for Biden. I was trying to explain to people, this is a cult. Trump is a cult and QAnon is a cult. And it, I mean, not everybody who likes Trump or votes for Trump is in a cult. I'm not, you know, I can't make that. Mm -hmm. It's just that, I mean, you don't go to a Biden rally and hear people yeah. go, Biden, Biden. <laughs> well, it's, it's like, uh, it's like, um, it's kind of weird. Um, we, said, we used to say, and I'm sure a lot of us still say that nobody likes their nobody likes their politicians. Even you don't even like your own guy that much. But, um, and, and the the cult, the thing is, people used to dismiss the fringe elements, and it seems like um, QAnon has become so influential that the people they like are not dismissing them. We'll, we'll put it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. So if there is a Okay, so here's a dual prong question. <laughs> uh, does QAnon have a core set of beliefs, and if so, what are they? Well, well, first of all, how did how did QAnon even begin? How did it come to the to the public consciousness? Um, it was October twenty eighth, twenty seventeen. A uh, Q clearance patriot first posted on 4chan. Um, Hillary Clinton, HRC arrest imminent, um, National Guard activated, blah, 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 blah. And at the time, I mean, we all know culture of 4chan, you know, I, I call it the Chanosphere, and it's very toxic. It's worse than Telegram and Gab on steroids. Put those two together, add some steroids. And 4chan is worse. And, but I mean, there were some good elements of 4chan too. You had the actual anonymous group, you know, working through 4chan too. But at the time there were, I think this was right around the time of Gamergate. So you had this toxic masculinity incel type of thing going on too. And there were other Anons posting. There was FBI, Insider Anon, National Guard, you know, all these accounts that were trying to peddle the same message. And this one just, you know, that they, they just figured, you know, even people who like Hillary don't really like Hillary. So let's go with that. And, um, and it just fit. And, you know, the 2016 election, I was one of the people that didn't bother to vote. I, I, call, I called the 2016 election aliens versus predator. No matter who wins, we all lose. And, um, you know, but it, it was, it blew a lot of people's minds. And I think they were just ripe and ready for this. And, and do you think whoever, it was, do you think, the, do you think that was it? Was it really just the Hillary thing that resonated with people more than the other Anon accounts? Like, like what, what, could have been. People, what convinced people that this guy, I assume he never really showed any good evidence. Uh, what convinced people that this was a guy in the know? I, I don't know. I, I think 
people were just crushed by the election. It just really messed up a lot of our brains. It looked bad of my, I mean, I never liked Trump, but it screwed with my head. No one, no one thought he was going to win. No one, no one. And that I think just destroyed everyone's Yes, I have read Cult of Trump by Steve Hassan. Um, it's, um, it's, it's just a weird thing. So, so, what is, so what is QAnon? What do these people actually believe? Well, the, um, the government is controlled by a shadowy deep state government um, that you know these aren't people who are elected or officially hired they're just kind of embedded and installed and these people are conducting weird stuff behind the scenes mostly involving children and um that they need to terrify and kill these kids in order to harvest their adrenochrome and um, you actually can buy adrenochrome online. It's completely legal. Aldo Huxley wrote about adrenochrome as a potential cure for schizophrenia in his book, The Doors of Perception. And he and Leary were working on that as part of the Harvard experiment, which was a voluntary element of MKUltra. And I, I have to stress that it was voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and they were researching into this. And um, apparently adrenochrome, when you buy the pharmaceutical grade, it just kind of gives you a little buzz. And I've heard a little headache. But the, um, the amount of adrenochrome that a child's body, even an adult body could produce is so small that it, it's just impossible for that harvesting to actually take place. And of course, like you said, this is all just recycled blood libel stuff. It's the, the people you don't like do terrible things to your kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, and that also, that kind of took off in the seventies because women were going to work more. So kids were in daycare and then you have important preschool trials. So any, any time, I, I always tell people to be very suspicious of anyone who is using Satan or children as an excuse for a movement, yeah. because those are just two heartstring tugging things. Rob, that's a good question. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so is there anything, well, I'm saving a question in reserve. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, did was the save the children thing an, an early part of QAnon? I have this impression that it kind of came later to attract less crazy people. It it, it, uh, it started emerging. That was the pastel side of QAnon, and the, and it was called pastel because it was like yoga moms who started posting, you know, pretty colored stuff on Instagram, and and it. it the, this uh, thing began to emerge during the lockdowns that the lockdowns were a cover up to free the enslaved mole children from underground tunnels, dumps, deep underground military bases. And Earth- You couldn't make that up, that's too good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it, but it, it is a real acronym, you know? And, um, and it's, and, and it also speaks to our psyche, you know, like Carl Jung and the archetypes underground. I mean, if I just say that word, take a second. And what do you think of when you think underground? Like it's, it's dark, it's deep, it's scary. And it just, it evokes an image. And so the COVID lockdowns were a cover up to arrest Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah Winfrey had posted on Twitter, uh, hey, I'm not arrested, I didn't do anything. And um, so that, that's Just what when a blood drinking thing... demon would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, that, and the, that's when the, the pastel really kicked in, but Save the Children is an actual legitimate organization right. that got their slogan hijacked. 
unfortunately. That had to be delivered by whoever's behind QAnon, right? Don't you think? I think it was more the, I, I'm not sure if it was Q that first started saying save the children, but it, it's a lot of, it's kind of like the Bible. You know, you, you have these words written down and you can make them mean whatever you want. So um, do you know, do you know, have, have there been any, as the QAnon mythology developed on 4chan and later 8chan, and we'll get to the difference between that and the sect here. Um, the, the revelations from this all-knowing Q, they came in, the, they were called Q drops colloquially. Um, now, has there been one since the, the, since the last presidential election? Has Q spoken uh, to his people? No, December 8th, 2020, we just recently celebrated one year without Q posting. Wow. And that was, yeah, that was his longest. And um, there was a poster, I think they named themselves B or R that, that posted something similar. And it's not, you know, it's not the same thing, but you can tell they're taking the stylistic elements of the Q posts to try and fake yeah. their own. So the puppet master is gone. What's going on with all the puppets? Well, the puppet master is currently running for Arizona Senate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But why is QAnon, why is it even the thing we still think about? What's, are these people just kind of like, have they started their own movement? Is it self-sustained well, now? It, it, kind of, it kind of is because you know, people, there was an LA Times article, the death of Q has not been exaggerated. And I just thought that was a little snarky um, because Jesus is dead. That doesn't mean that people stop believing in him or God or the Bible, you know, Krishna, Buddha, you know, just because the core of that religion is gone does not mean that that religion or cult is going to go away. I, I'm not saying Christianity is a cult. I was just using, you know, of but um, it it just, I, I think QAnon is kind of like geocaching for conspiracies. It's it's something that you can look for clues and and you know to be honest, that's fun when you when you find a little nugget of something that connects something to something else, whether it's real or not, that's, that's a cool feeling. And um, currently in uh, Dallas, Texas, there is, QAnon has formed a physical cult called Negative uh, 48. They've been uh, camped out in the Hyatt in Dealey Plaza for, since November 2nd. And um, it's escalating. It's getting they, very bad. Do they identify themselves as QAnon? Um, well, drop 4881. <laughs> there is Q, there are nods, there is no QAnon. Okay. So that's that's what they'll say. And they're, they're big on JFK Jr. And uh, that's what I, I was going to ask is that is that yeah. the connection there? Yeah, and I, I recommend David Gilbert's articles on Vice News. He's been covering this. And David Williams, um, he's with a local paper. And Steve Monticelli from Rolling Stone, too. They've, they've been covering it. Um, okay, so you mentioned it, and Rob asked about it. Uh, these things are in interconnected. Um, on HBO, the miniseries, uh, Q Into the Storm. Um, what do you think about that? Did it really reveal that Ron Watkins is Q? Who is Ron you, Watkins? I actually didn't see that episode. Oh, you haven't watched it? Oh. No, yeah. no. But I I saw the clip, you know, that, that yeah. reveal. And I was like, yeah, I can see this. <laughs> He's got a, an anime sex doll. Uh, so yeah, I could see this. He's he's very creepy. <laughs> well, so is his well, dad. tell us well tell us about Ron Watkins and the transition from 4chan to 8chan and all that. Well, um, I know uh, until recently, Q's longest absence, I believe, was between like 
late 2017 and I think early 2018. And he disappeared. And I think someone found the password, which was MacGyver1. <laughs> and, and there were issues with the trip codes and stuff. And um, so he was gone for a while. And all of a sudden, he popped back on 8chan. And that was really when it took off more was when it migrated to H and it, it was able to reach like a larger audience. And who is who is Ron Watkins? Who, what is his involvement in all this? Well, a, a lot of people think that he was the second Q that him and possibly his father. But he did he found H Chan or did he what how did he? Fred Brennan. Um, he created a Chan. He took a mushroom trip and he saw a vision of the infinity symbol. So that's, so he called it a Chan and Fred at the time was kind of in the incel culture. He, he, he has a disability and he's also a little person. Um, he's a very sweet guy though, but, um, he created this and the Watkins reached out to him and they knew about his disability and they're like, hey, you can get better health care down here in the Philippines. So he moved down there with them. And, you know, Q hijinks were abounding. And um, then it took a turn for the worse. I, I'm not sure what year it was. Brennan, I think maybe in like 2019, Brennan and Watkins had a falling out. Brennan and Jim Watkins, the dad, and Brennan posted something on social media like, I think Jim Watkins has dementia. Mm -hmm. So Jim Watkins, you know, the bastion of free speech, um, decided to use the Philippine libel laws against Brennan. There was an arrest warrant out for Brennan. And if you're in a wheelchair and you have brittle bone disease, and you're a little person, you're not going to survive in a jail, especially a Philippine jail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was later on revealed that Colin Hoback, the, the director of the HBO series, was the man who smuggled him out of the country. Yeah, I was going to say, you can act, you, I, I've watched Into the Storm, and it is, I think it is a good thing to, to put your eyes on. Yeah, it documents a lot of that. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, when I was watching it, I didn't like watch all of it because I was like, there wasn't much in it that I hadn't already seen, you know? Right, right. But it does, I think it does, um, put, <laughs> it does get you to know these people and uh, just see, you know, I can imagine a quote unquote normal person being like, oh, how can somebody do this? How can just somebody just lie to everybody like this? When you see these people, you can kind of understand because they're not normal people. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Jim Watkins owned, I don't know if it was a server or a website or something, but it was called Is It Wet Yet? Yes. So I think that tells you everything you need to know about Jim. <laughs> well, Jim, I mean, he is, he has money, right? Like how he built some kind of minor fortune somehow, didn't he? Yeah, he had a pig farm, which brings up questions how many missing people in the Philippines <laughs> have never been found. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm not implied yeah. that he murdered anyone, but I mean, <laughs> when I hear pig farm, that's what I think. Yeah. Of. Right. <laughs> and then his son, Rob, and then again, I'm, I'm not as deep into it as you are. So I'm just taking kind of things from the documentary. Um, and then it seems like his son, Ron just kind of never did anything his whole life and decided maybe this was an interesting thing to play with. Yeah, I, 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 I guess so. I mean, the, 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 um, the Q drops and mentioned watches and pens both point to both of the Watkins. Jim has an obsession with pens. Like you can, I mean, he has like hundred dollar pens, thousand dollar pens, like really special ones and stuff. And that was an element. And I think Ron was the one that was in watches or something, but there was just, I think what it is, is just the Chan culture. Like, let's mess with people just to mess with them, you know? And they call, so these Chan things, they call them image boards. Is that fundamentally different than like an old message board or anything like that? 
I've, I've never actually been on either one because I'm terrified. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, really, like... Basically, basically, I guess you could say it's, it's, a, it's a gathering place for some of the worst people with the worst opinions on things. And, and also, I don't want to be one of those people to be scrolling through it and go, oh, crap, there's child pornography. I've just <laughs> committed a crime by seeing it. <laughs> you know, and... Um, and that that was the one of the most ironic elements about QAnon when it migrated to 8chan because 8chan was just full of child pornography. And then here's this Q Clarence Patriot saying, you know, all the elites, all the Democrats, all the Jews, they eat children and molest them. And um, <laughs> right next to that is a picture of child porn. And I mean... <laughs> You know, but but Q was, I mean, whoever he is, whether he was Ron and Jim and Paul Ferber or whatnot, was very smart because one of his posts was that disinformation is necessary. So that is the most clever thing ever. It'd be like a math teacher telling you one plus one equals two but sometimes it has to equal three. <laughs> uh, so even when something's wrong, you know, people be like, well, Q said disinformation is necessary. Right. This is a test. So, so what is, uh, so you brought it up a little bit. What is, uh, in the year since Q has been silent, what has Ron Watkins been doing? Well, I, I kind of saw this coming a little bit, not like, you know, like I foretold it, but Ron started, Ron was like in December of 2020, shortly after Q's last post, Ron was like, the election is over. We have to move on with our lives. And then all of a sudden- This is, this is Ron posting as Ron. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden came this flood of you know the deep rig what they call you know the election conspiracies and ron was a he pushed hard on this and i was like this sounds like a man who is going to run for office but knows he doesn't have a chance in hell of winning i mean because you saw that with trump in 2016 trump was like if they win it's going to be the most fraudulent thing ever. It's it's a way to protect yourself from what you expect to be a downfall. And then Ron announced he was running for, I think, Senate. I forget what district, but in Arizona. And was I was that, like, yep, that's what he was working towards. Was that, did that happen this past fall, that election? Yeah, yeah, he, he announced that he was running and- yeah. um, Clearly, he didn't were, win. <laughs> well, well, no, he he just announced like I guess he was running and running for the next one. Oh, in six years, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I I'm not I'm not sure. I didn't I didn't get all that. But I've been that. told I've been told I don't know if he's seen this, but with the I've been told he's he's leaned more into UFO disclosure recently. Have you have you heard that? He was doing that for a little bit. Ron is the um, ADD of conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, he was going to do the the alien leaks, and then that just kind of faltered. He's he's basically just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping that something sticks, which is what you saw when Q first started posting too. Yeah. So to be clear, I don't think there's any real direct evidence that this person was behind QAnon, but he owned the website. Or his dad owned the website, where is the only place Q would talk. Clearly, he has similar beliefs. Clearly, an intelligent person, very good at uh, computer stuff. His alias is Code Monkey. And code he, Monkey Z. Oh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and if you again, I do, I do encourage people to watch into the storm. It is kind of a slow yeah. analysis, but at the same time, um, the big reveal moment, which I don't think is as re revelatory as a lot of people say, but the documentary uh, filmmaker who had been talking to these people for years, um, he's talking to him and he said, uh, basically, um, he said, uh, <laughs> I, if I'm remembering this right, the filmmaker says to him, 
well, if you were Q, blah, blah, blah. If you were Q, and I'm not saying you are. And then he says, um, and then he gives this big, long, in-depth answer. And then looks him straight in the camera and says, but I'm not Q. And then laughs. <laughs> so a lot of people took that as a sort of like, he couldn't help it. He just kind of, it just kind of burst out of him and uh, sort of spoiled his own conspiracy. You should go watch it. Uh, I'm not doing it justice, but um, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but there sure is a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, and, and also, it, even if he or his father weren't directly Q, um, they had direct access to who Q was. So they, if they were not doing it, they were the gatekeeper. Right. Right. Um, we have one more terrible question here from Bill. And I'm not saying that the question is terrible, Bill. No, no. Uh, don't you really have to hate someone to believe they eat children? I would say yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, go back in history to Kristallnacht, to pogroms yeah. and to the Holocaust, Let's which many believe didn't even happen now. Yeah. Well, we talk about how so much of QAnon is just recycled and pasted together from old conspiracies. Now you can kind of draw a through line from the blood libels, but that's what it, that's basically how it started, that Christians were thought that the Jews were draining the blood from their children. And obviously Christians haven't always liked the Jews so much. Yeah, and, and also, and I, I had never even considered this, but the, um, the caricature of the Nosferatu movie, The Silent Film, starring Max Schreck. If you look at the facial features and being hunched over, it looks like an old draw, racist drawing of Jewish people. And then the vampire is drinking blood. Hmm. So the, the, a lot of the vampire myths kind of overlapped with the blood libel. Okay. So, before we get to questions, let's take it down a notch. What are some of the craziest off the wall things you've seen that you people believe in? Um, okay, the leader of the Dallas cult, Michael Protzman, he is the re he is JFK Jr. in disguise, <laughs> but he is also Jesus oh. and God. Um, and Michael Jackson sings with the Rolling Stones now. Oh. Um, what happened? I, I, I'm, I'm sure Keith Richards has a body double out there somewhere. <laughs> so maybe, you know. And, uh, and there's another irony to that, that they venerate that this, and this isn't all of QAnon. This is the negative 48 cult in Dallas. The fact that they venerate a man who we have pretty damning evidence probably did some bad things to some kids. And they like him. Well, here's what I don't understand. Why does, well, first of all, I don't understand why they think JFK Jr. is alive to begin with, but why did, I don't understand the connection to Q. Why do they think he'd be, want, be a part of Q? Well, the, the, the JFK Jr. thing, just if it kind of came into the, I mean, if you look, the most enduring cursed family in the history of the United States and the most enduring conspiracy theory in the United States, JFK. And then, you know, JFK is assassinated and then his son dies in an airplane. His brother gets shot by an assassin. and you know, the, the man who treated Jack Ruby in prison after Ruby shot Oswald was uh, Dr. Jolien West, who was an MK Ultra scientist. I mean, that's confirmed. Uh -huh. So, and then um, I guess he treated Sirhan, Sirhan too. That was the guy who did RFK, I think. And so there are elements of the JFK thing that I are see. just so deeply embedded. So basically, you just throw it in a blender and see what comes up. Yeah, yeah, but, but there's also, <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I feel weird saying this, but I really hate Oliver Stone for making that damn movie. Oh, I hear you. It's terrible. 
I mean, it's a good movie. It's just like, I mean, I'm watching it when I'm like 12 or 13 and I'm like, wow, finally conclusive answers. <laughs> Not just a movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me about, now this is, I'm going to put a link in here to the article you wrote me about QAnon in relation to uh, Department of Truth. What is Blue Anon? Um, Blue Anon, well, that was actually recently in the news. Um, Blue Anon is people who are against QAnon, but still have the same, like, vicious online man mentality. Um, oh, you don't agree with me? Well, then you're a pedophile. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And then there's like doxing and backstabbing and stuff. And um, there was, I don't know if it made any big papers or anything, but um, Jim Stewartson is a big blue and on person, except they call it Stu and on. Um, and he's an anti Q guy. And he said, he posted something on Twitter that uh, Joe Rogan is Steve Bannon's gimp. All right. And uh, that got him banned from Twitter. And um, Kathy Griffin came to his aid and he got his Twitter account back and all that. But he actually started researching Q around the same time as I did. And I'm not trying to say I'm better. I'm just trying to compare. <laughs> he came right into it and said, I'm the expert. I know it all. And you know, everything was money, 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 money. So he almost has his own cult that's sprung yeah. up around him. Do they, uh, does QAnon get into like the weirdest, because I know you, I've, you've seen you talk about like resurrections and, uh, well, obviously JFK Jr. did, well, I don't even know where to start. Resurrections, reptilians, do they, do they really cover it all? Like do most Q believers understand this is part of it? Oh yeah, it, it's, it's, um, but that, but it's like, if you like Asian food, but you're not sure what you're hungry for, you go to a buffet, you're gonna find something there that you like. And you just eat until you're full and then walk away. <laughs> Do you think though that like, you know, obviously some Q adjacent people have made it into politics now, have, you know, a little more well-known in the mainstream. Do you think those people know or and or believe the weirdest parts of it Do they even know it's there i think i think there's two levels of evil to that answer uh -huh. there are the people who are into it because they're just into it like marjorie taylor green is just hardcore and then there are the people who are into it because they know that it will push their populist fascist agenda. And, I, and I'm not trying to say, like, I'm not in certain adjectives that don't belong there. Like, it is it is a populist fascist agenda. And um, it's, uh, I'm more scared of the true believers than I am the grifters. I mean, they're right. both equally damaging, but... I mean, there, there's a Vice News article, um, the father of a Parkland shooting survivor accuses his son of being a crisis actor and Marjorie Taylor Greene pilled the dad. How do you do that to your child? Mm. How do you stand there and say, you're a liar. You were hired by George Soros to fake the school shooting. The mind boggles. <laughs> Well, if anyone else has any mind boggling questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, just put it in uh, just be before your post, put question, the word question in all caps. So we see it. Um, Stephanie, where, what are you doing for outreach right now? Uh, well, where, where can we find your stuff? Um, I, I'll put my, should I put it in the chat? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm basically just on uh, Twitter. And I'll put my email address in there too. But you said anyone... you write for you write for even the podcast is afraid. Mm -hmm. um, are you 
would you say you're active on Twitter, just engaging with people about conspiracy stuff, or, or what is your te- what are your techniques? I try to kind of use it like as I, I don't I, I try to avoid directly engaging with QAnon people because I like my account. I've worked up my account, and uh, I don't want to lose my account. <laughs> And um, I, I reach out to other researchers and, you know, we'll do discussions, just talk about things. Um, I'm currently working on a project with Chitarth, um, a, a kind of like the, the QAnon casualties subreddit, except we're creating our own website that's similar to that. And um, I'm also, I've also been helping one of the families that escaped from Dallas. Um, It was a woman and two children and um, they're safe now and they're staying with someone. Um, I just sent out a whole bunch. I've been getting donations for them because these kids need to have a Christmas and they've just been through something terrible. When you said escaped from Dallas, they were part of this group hold up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is something I hadn't heard about. This seems like the next potential disaster. <laughs> yeah, because QAnon was always a decentralized digital cult, and now it's a physical centralized, you know, and, and even more terrifying was that they've been looking for property for a oh. compound in Waco. Here we go. Here in we Waco. Go. Yep. It's the 90s all over again. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's um, and and they're posting stuff on their Telegram about the last dance and the termination event. Oh no! I sure hope yeah. somebody with more power than we have is watching this. Um, I I I hope. I mean that the people have been notified. That's all sure. I can say. Um, if you also want to see more of Stephanie, she's been doing stuff for me on AIPT Science, uh, AIPT Comics. I just put her author in bio in the uh, in the chat, including a four part just concluded series on the conspiracy theories that you know, of the TV show Gotham that Ron Watkins may or may not have pulled for QAnon. Yeah, and and there's actually some elements within the later seasons of Gotham because these episodes were being filmed before the 2016 election. Um, the Marina Abramovich quote for the, the spirit cooking quote you could tell that that was directly lifted from pizzagate and yeah. also when the penguins running for mayor his slogan is make gotham safe again <laughs> so it, it's like i think they just started with these weird beliefs and then as stuff in real life started getting crazier right. the gotham creators were just like let's go all in on this yeah <laughs> yeah sounds good and man. and um, and in the most recent season of American Horror Story, um, they actually mentioned QAnon by name. Was that in the Was that in the Aliens part, the second half? No, the first half, the Red okay. Tide. I didn't watch. Yeah. That. Okay. Um, and question. there's a literal black pill in the <laughs> first part too. So, question from Kevin. I think you kind of touched on this. I don't know. If Kevin came in late uh, when you were quote in the cult did you believe what you were saying I mean you you really took it down yeah yeah I I don't and I know this sounds ridiculous for someone to say this but you can trust me because I'm not Alex Jones saying this okay I did believe in what I said and I'm not capable of grifting people I can't I don't have that in me so I wasn't like that's just what a a grifter would say yeah yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Rob says, um, we talked about this. Uh, if you've seen the, the series on Netflix, Inside Job. Yes, I love it. I love it. And I still I still got to get finished on that. I have to rewatch it and get those little Easter eggs, but I've found some real good ones. Yeah. Uh, well, Rob's just asking that as an excuse so that I'll post the article he did for me about it. (laughs) Well, I'd like to read it. I'm going to post it right now. There it is. Um, (laughs) Rob says, yay. 
Uh, <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions for um, Stephanie or anybody? So this is, I'm nominally calling this um, part two of my SkepCom online interview series. Um, first up a couple months ago was um, uh, Toby Ball, the host of the Strange Arrivals UFO History podcast. If you weren't here for that, that was, um, it's very, it's told in a very true crime manner because that's where he comes from. So it's a lot of uh, set up and laying out the mystery. But then at the end, he says, okay, here's what we really know about it. And I say he does the Scooby-Doo and pulls the mask off, which is, um, I think, a really effective way to communicate. And it's something that we haven't really thought about. And um, yeah, so uh, this is another reason I wanted to talk to you, Stephanie, today to see um, how you're kind of trying to influence people on the, in the online area. Um, you have anything else you want to say about that? Like, uh, well, I just want my my important thing is, you know, I, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or any of that. But if anyone out there wants to reach out, you know, has questions, needs help, don't whether it's me or it's a licensed professional, don't be afraid to do that, and don't be afraid to admit that you were wrong because. You know, it's kind of like the guy that sneaks a cigarette in the bar when he's not supposed to. All it takes is one person, then another person's doing it, and all of a sudden, everyone's smoking at the bar. It just takes one person to start it, and then others will join. And the more people speak out and talk about their experiences, the more they will kind of understand that it's okay and that will accept them back. I always tell people doubt is the way out. If you're questioning what you believe, then examine that and look into it, it further. And, you know, I, I'm not coming at this from a therapist perspective. I'm coming this from a perspective of someone who has had a lot of mental health problems in their life. And I can tell you distinctly that now that the conspiracy theories are gone, I can tell when a depressive stage is coming on and I prepare for it. And I'm like, okay, I got nothing to do for a week. I'm just going to sleep this out. You know, I'm, I'm able to deal with things. I went from being depressed all the time to now when I get depressed, I actually look on the bright side and go, hey, this is a chemical thing. Now my depression is purely chemical and I appreciate that. So I, I think that's important. And um, this is still in the planning stages, but I figured I'd kind of plug it now. Um, I am, it, you know, it might fall through, who knows, but um, a friend of mine and I are planning our own podcast and we're going to call it Crime Spiracy. And he's a retired FBI, FBI special agent who worked on child trafficking cases. And um, so he's the, you know, the crime specialist with an interest in conspiracy theories. And I'm the conspiracy theorist specialist with an interest in crime and not committing it, you know. <clears throat> and um, because I noticed that there's a lot of overlap in the true crime community and conspiratorial thinking. You know, that you saw that with the Gabby Petito case. Oh, that was an arm reaching up from the garden. He's <laughs> hidden under the garden. No. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, uh, true crime cases that have a real or imagined conspiratorial element oh, to them. That's, a, that's interesting. That's, I think that's a good approach, yeah. Um, Rob still wants to talk about inside job. Um, it's actually something that you that you and I well you put at the end of your final Gotham article. Um, yeah, he seemed, he wants to know what do you think a true believer would really think of inside job? And he says, I posted it to a fringe group, and even though it's an active place, nobody commented. You talked about in the um, your final Gotham article about the power of mockery over conspiracy belief. Well. The fact that no one replied to the article could actually be a good thing. Right. Could mean that someone saw it and was like, oh, 
man, and they're just <laughs> sobbing. And it could, it could be, yeah. you know, it, it, it could be that. And it's also, you know, having to click on a link to read <laughs> an article is also, you know. Yeah. But that's uh, actually, um, we had our, our skeptic camp uh, last weekend, and I talked about, um, you know, general ideas about skeptical communication. And we talked a little bit about the backfire effect, um, about how mm, you can kind of give people the facts, but if they're already predisposed to believe something else, it might work for a little bit. But then later on, they'll say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy was talking about it, too. It must be true, because I remember he was talking about it, too. And the whole uh, context kind of disappears. Um, so there's always a concern, like when you bring something up like that, like here we're telling you it's dumb, but are you gonna forget the dumb part and just remember the conspiracy part? Um, that's a tough psychological nut to crack. I think there's, um, I think there's research on both sides of that. For me, I, I try to approach it as like, look, I was once like you, and. If you want to save the kids, you want to be active online, get a web sleuth account. Maybe you can help solve a crime and it'll fit in with their conspiratorial thinking too. And you know, you can always get a free account on NamUs or you can volunteer for NICMIC. And if I ever hear anyone say a disparaging word about John Walsh, we're gonna have some problems. <clears throat> you know, I mean, you can volunteer for Nick Mick, you can volunteer for search and rescue, you know, and you can sit at home and try and match unidentified bodies to missing persons on NamUs. I mean, I've, I've done it, you're not hurting anything. Potentially, maybe you find a match and then this person has their name back. So, you know, there's a lot that you can actually do and uh, my ex boyfriend's parents created an organization called Maddie Angel M A D D Y Angel. Um, my ex's eight year old daughter was brutally killed by a fifteen year old, and they've started this nonprofit to help raise awareness, not from stranger danger, but from the actual fact that most children are at risk from someone they know. And, and I think that offering people alternatives is a good way to help them step back from that mindset. Yeah, well, that was another thing. It was, was a replacing, replacing the, the bad narrative with a more realistic and helpful one. That seems to, because uh, if you, there's an old adage in science that you can't tear down an old theory unless you have a better one to replace it. And, I'm going to guess the mind sort of works the same way, you know, you can't just say, no, this is wrong and then leave somebody with a void because they're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the okay. And thing kind of yeah. can, can help with that too. And, and also I, I just try to approach it from, look, I was like you, let's talk about this. Tell me what you think and let's, you know, let's come to a middle. Okay. Yes, the buildings fell. Yes, there were real, real people who died in 9-11. But let's get you away from the no planes and get you back to the remote control. And like, let's take it a few steps down until we can get out of that. Because I'll, I'll tell you to this day, there are still some elements of 9-11 that have me confused and I'm not sure of. And, and, and if World Trade Center 7 is what keeps you tied to 9-11, just so everyone knows, they are only showing you the collapse mm -hmm. side. They're not showing you the backside of the building that was burned and almost destroyed. All the conspiracists mm -hmm. are always showing you the front side. 